Okay, hello and welcome to my talk on Color V1 in Chromium and open source software. My, no my name is Dominic. I work at Google on fonts and text rendering in Chrome and Blink. I'm part of the layout team in Chrome. Projected to the wall, you see a stylized version of the Tower of Hercules here in A Coruña. I am expecting it to be featured in the walking tour as well. In this talk, I'll show you how this tower is not only working as an image here in this um, presentation, but also as a font. And um, I would call what we can make through this talk the first Galician emoji font. And so um, since this is a hack fest, you can contribute to it if you have other ideas what should go into that font. First to explain color v1, is a vector color font format that we've developed as a collaboration between uh, the Blink team and the Google Fonts team and others at Microsoft and um, Behat Esfabot contributed to it. So already a shout out to my colleagues at Google Fonts, Rod Sheeter and Cosimo Lupu, who worked on color fonts with us together. Today I would like to focus on the foundations of color v1 being, uh, that we use in Chrome being open source. So I'll talk about the open source components that um, enable rendering of color v1 in, uh, in Chrome and also how we released open source components for making color v1 fonts. So perhaps first a little bit of an introduction into color fonts is something that we go through in this talk. How does the color v1 format work? H how do we enable new use cases on the web with this? And um, then we go into the open source color v1 stack and the tools to make that such fonts. And for the first time in a conference, I'll give you a little um, preview of what variations, open type variations and variable color fonts are and how they work in the preview version of, of Chrome. So let's talk about color fonts. Of course, it's been possible for a long time to colorize fonts. So here you see the lobster font that's available on Google Fonts, and you can change the color of it. Of course, you can CSS style it to green and so on. But um, it's a little bit different from color fonts in the sense that I want to talk about today. Here you see an emoji of the Noto emoji set of the, the National Park emoji. And what we mean by color fonts here is color inside the glyph, so using multiple colors inside the glyph. This is another example. This is the bungee um, font made by David Jonathan Ross. It's inspired by street signs and this kind of street sign artwork. It features this small hairline in the middle of the glyphs, which is a bit hard to see. But so you can create attention or you can, you can give um, text more liveliness through, through using color fonts. Here is an example of uh, material two-tone icons. So like using the material icon set with extra color to enhance the kind of meaning of the glyphs. Or in this example of uh, Arabic script, color is used to simulate ink effects. This font is called um, Reem Kufi. It's made by Khaled Hosni and it, it, uh, the intention is to simulate the ink effects of uh, Arabic calligraphy in this Arabic Qfix style typeface. So let's look at the color v1 format. So far bitmap fonts, for example Apple's SPIX format and Google's CBDT, CBLC format have been used to make uh, colorful glyphs. Um, OpenType SVG exists as a font format that encodes color vector graphics as well. However, we found issues with space efficiency implementation complexity and integration with existing font concepts with OpenType SVG. That's why we designed Color V1 form, the, the Color V1 format, which is, addresses these issues. So let's take a look at how the Color V1 format works in detail and how efficient it is at encoding color vector graphics. So first I want to start with this like basic explanation of what the format works and how this algorithm for drawing color v1 glyphs work. Color v1 glyphs are a directed acyclic graph of paint operations. Rendering a color v1 glyph means 
traverse the graph and execute the 2D graphics operations in each node. I'm going to walk through an example. So in Color V1 fonts, we have this, uh, we have this graph of paint operations for each glyph. And here we have, we have an example of a paint rotate operations combined with a paint glyph operations um, and a paint radial gradient or a paint color glyph op um, operation. So this is the graph as it can be in the font. So it, it can actually take only one pass. So here I made these two at the bottom just to show like what, what you can place there in, as variations. So walking through the graph, first we rotate the drawing canvas, then we apply the paint glyph operation, and then we apply the paint radial gradient operation, which kind of fills this glyph. And so we end up with this uh, gradient filled star shape on the right side. Now, if we change the graph a little bit, and at the, at, uh, at the bottom, instead of the paint ra uh, radial gradient operation, we put a paint color glyph operation, we can fill the star shape with the content of another glyph in the font. So it's like a way to reuse something uh, inside the font. You can make one glyph that's like an encapsulation of something that you need for other glyphs, and then you can use it in multiple places. Here's like a, um, a slide that's too full of text, but just to give you an idea of what are the possible operations. And I just want to highlight a few things. Um, you see those in, in, like in the sec or third section there, you see paint solid, paint linear gradient, paint radial gradient, paint sweep gradient. These are all the ways to bring color and to bring different kinds of filling operations to the glyphs. Then at the bottom, you see more like um, geometric transformations like paint transform, translate, scale, and so on. So these are operations for rescaling and, and, and moving things around inside the, inside the drawing space of the glyph. Another thing that's important here is that for each of the drawing operations you have on the left side, there's a variable counterpart of it. That means this is intended to integrate color V1 fonts with uh, variable fonts variable fonts that allow the user of the font to apply parameters to it so that the representation of the glyphs changes. And, and we'll see a bit more on that later. I mentioned that Color V1 allows you to reuse shapes. And um, this is really important, for example, for emoji font, where a lot of variations exist on the same glyph. And uh, that is one of the ways we arrive at good space efficiency and good compression with this font format. So here with this cat emoji or this ninja emoji, you see that most of the shapes are the same and can be reused across these glyphs. Here in this um, crystal ball emoji, it's similar, like the star shapes here can be reused and don't need to be re-encoded um, to save space. So what kind of new web use cases can we do with uh, Color V1 and what kind of problems does it solve on the web? First of all, I think the most important problem for fonts on the web is size, especially with large bitmap fonts or, or like with what large graphics fonts or visual fonts. And um, comparing the Noto emoji set, we managed to bring it down from 9 megabyte for the Noto Color Emoji bitmap font to about 1.85 megabyte for Noto um, to represent the same glyph set. At the same time, the rendering fidelity is actually higher because we're not scaling from bitmap fonts anymore up and down, but we're actually doing a vector rasterization. So if you're going down with the font size, and then we can still have additional methods like subsetting the font, etc. If you can bring down the font size, then it becomes possible to actually use a font natively for emoji on the web. So if you look at this like screenshot from WhatsApp here, then you see that what happens with WhatsApp on the web is actually that um, emo uh, emoji are replaced with inline images, and that complicates your whole text handling. So you can't easily copy and paste because then the images would be in it, so there has to be interception of that and so on. So what we want to achieve with Color V1 is 
less usage of image replacement and just like using a font for the purpose so that all this extra handling of cut, cut and paste operations and so on doesn't have to be done anymore. And generally, allow, uh, generally, perhaps Color V1 allowing you to do more interesting things with text for headlines and like graphical elements of your page. So let's look at this, this kind of open source aspect of the whole Color V1 standardization and also tooling development. Um, first, in terms of the open source components for, used in Chrome, let's look at the rasterization side, and then we're going to take a look at the uh, font creation side and what open source tools exist for that. Color V1 is available in Chrome since Chrome Milestone 98. Um, we released a blog post on this when you, if you're interested in taking a closer look. In Chrome version 100, we released font palette in addition. So font palette CSS styling together with color V1 allows you to even change the colors used in a uh, emoji font or in another color font and, and it together provide a really powerful tool for enhancing the text on your page. So color V1 is a new format and we can't expect system rasterizers like direct write or core graphics or core text um, on, on, on important platforms to support it yet. So what do we do to ship it nevertheless across all platforms? And for doing that, we have um, using a concept that we call hybrid font stack in Chrome. So we download a font as a web font and we decide what features does it use? Is it a variable font? Is it a color v1 font? And so on. And then we switch the rasterizer. Either we send it through direct write or through um, core text, etc., to place the text pixels on the screen, or we decide to go through the open source stack rasterizer consisting of Skia and FreeType. So in the open source foundations for Color V1 in Chrome, we have Chrome's font stack on like the Blink font stack um, that kind of controls the operation of, of dependencies that we're using, which is the Skia graphics library, which traverses the color v1 glyph graph and executes the drawing operations that I was showing in this example of the star-shaped glyph, and the free type library, which uh, understands the binary of the font size, or actually understands the font binary, and can give us all this very compactly encoded information in a format through an API that we can then use in Skia for drawing these glyphs. And um, in FreeType, this was released in FreeType version 2.11. And in Skia, this was released in the version that matches Chrome 98. So this is the rasterization side of things. But of course, when you introduce a new font format, you, it's a bit of a chicken and egg problem. Like, what do you test with? You can try to implement it just against the specification, but you want a test font to work with and actually bring something on the screen. So we needed the tools to create these fonts at the same time. So we have a similar open source stack for making these color v1 fonts. And that consists of nano emoji, font tools, and Pico SVG. I'm going to go into details of what these actually are. Nano Emoji takes a set of SVG source images, other meta information such as the intended font name, and outputs a font. This is usually a color v1 font, um, but we developed Nano Emoji so that it can output open type SVG fonts as well. And it can use different glyph formats such as the um, the true type glyph format or CFF2 contours. We also made nano emoji with the intention to being able to comparing open type SVG or bitmap formats against color v1 in terms of size and, and performance. Nano emoji uses font tools to converting from and to the binary font representation and encoding the font info, uh, encoding the color font info into the actual font binary. It uses Pico SVG for flattening and preparing the SVG source images and turning them into 
color we want glyphs. So in terms of what, what do you need to do for going from SVG into color we want? Designers tend to use tools that give you SVGs that are quite complex. For example, in a single file, you will find duplicate, invisible or effectively invisible shapes, degenerate gradients, verbose encoding, or unwanted metadata or references that point backwards and forwards and so on. So these, in a raw form, don't lend themselves well to sending them through the pipeline we, we use for building color we want fonts. So that's why we developed um, Pico SVG to kind of canonicalize and simplify the SVGs before turning them into color v1 font. So the SVGs that Pico SVG generates have exactly one definition, only groups and paths, only absolute coordinates, and the clip paths in an SVG are pre-applied and strokes are converted into paths. Then in the second stage, Nano emoji with these prepared SVGs puts it together and generates all these paint operations that were listed on this previous slide and outputs that into an open, uh, an open type font. So I want to give you a quick demo of uh, nano emoji in, in action. Do I have a cursor? Yeah. Where is the other screen? Hmm. I can't seem to move this window to the other screen. Now it works. OK, here we go. Um, yes, so here is my um, development environment in a way. I can see that in this uh, directory, I have an SVG file named emoji and then a certain code point. And then I can run nano emoji, which now converts this whole thing into a font. And so this SVG file was the um, was the tower that I was talking about before. And so when I load this into the browser, um, I can now type the emoji for this rotating warning light. And then you see the Tower of Hercules there. <laughs> now I was mentioning this is um, intended as a Galician emoji file. But it's not complete yet, right? So let's see what happens when I type the emoji for octopus. <laughs> OK, so um, yeah, so this works as a color font in the browser. It also scales, so you can reduce and, and enlarge the font size. And um, it scales without kind of bitmap scaling artifacts. OK, let's see how I come back to my presentation from here. Uh, I think I need to see the other screen. Uh, let me do this again. Oh. Okay. Right. So this was the nano emoji demo. Um, similarly, there is this um, similarly there is an open source tool called Font Goggles, um, which 
uses these Python in, this Python infrastructure, Nano Emoji and um, Pico SVG, and uh, no, sorry, not Pico SVG, but uses Nano Emoji. Uh, sorry, uses font tools and um, the, its understanding of color we want to display this font as well. Let me try to bring that up to the screen as well. So, um, so here's font tools, and I can go and open the um, font that I just built. And so if I uh, use, again, this um, warning light emoji, then um, you see that it shows in, in font goggles as well. And here you see the scaling as well. So font goggles is a, t as a font preview tool. And um, it's an alternative implementation of Color V1 that exists in open source. Okay. Yes, and at the end of this talk, um, I mentioned we would go in, and take a look at something that's kind of bleeding edge and, and look at the integration between um, color v1 and variations and open type variations. So I mentioned at the beginning of the slide all the color v1 operations have variable counterparts. So you can make a font that is somewhat dynamic and you can apply variations to it and change its appearance without changing the font binary. So here is um, here's a demo of the Bungie font, and I um, made a special kind of version of it that uses color v1 gradients. And to convince you that this is actually a font, I can type something here. And then if I use this slider, you can see that this gradient actually shifts. So it's the same font binary, it's just applying different CSS, which then is applied to this variable font to change the um, appearance of it. And you can think about many applications of this um, for, for creating variable emoji fonts or to create fonts that animate things even, and, and so on. Here's another example of this with um, these glyphs don't particularly mean anything. These were more intended as, as test glyphs. And you can see that I can move the color stops. And uh, so you can see how the gradients change. And I can, um, for example, move the appearance here so that the radial gradients change. Or here, the x2 coordinate of, of linear gradients so that um, the orientation of the gradients changes. So all of this is variable. Um, this is a preview, not yet released in Canary or anything. It's just um, something that we're working on at the moment for the next iteration of uh, Color V1. Okay. And then... To wrap up, now we have seen which open source libraries provide the foundation for Color V1 in Chrome, which are FreeType and Skia, and what open source tools we have released for making Color V1's fonts, which are Nano Emoji, Pico SVG, and um, font tools. In Chrome 62, we released variable fonts, and uh, now that was present or that was presented in the Hackfest. Uh, Web Engines Hackfest uh, in 2018, so I'm happy to be here today to present variable color v1 in um, 2022. So color, f color fonts and their use on the web is something that we looked at today. What are the use cases that we uh, can, can realize with them? We've seen the color v1 internals 
and the open source libraries for rasterization font production and variable color v1. So thank you, and I'm awaiting your contributions to the Galician emoji font. What should be in there? <laughs> Just let me know. Excellent talk, Dominic. I want an emoji for myself. Yeah? Um, well, um, we learn a lot of things here, and, and the first one, I want emoji again. Um, and also, uh, to sorry, uh, because I, I, I didn't um, adjust the microphone as supposed to do in the past talk. I lost my karaoke skills since the pandemic. Now, I think you can hear me, yeah? At home? Looks like it, yes. Well, um, do we have any questions here? for Dominic before we start. Let's see at home if they have some questions. Someone is writing. It's not writing anymore. <laughs> well, the first question I have here, it's uh, about CSS. How this could work and would work with CSS and, and so? So generally, uh, to use a color v1 font, uh, you don't need to do anything except specifying this is um, my font face URL. So if a browser supports it, then, um, then you would get this kind of enhancement that the font shows in color. Now, there are some things that are interested, interesting when talking about the interaction between these fonts and CSS. So um, one thing is how do you feature detect or how do you make your CSS that your page looks one way if the user agent supports color v1 and another way if it doesn't. So one way is just to say um, I'm listing my color v1 font first in the source line, and if the browser understands it, it uses this one, otherwise it falls back to the next one. But we're also working on feature detection for color v1 so that you can use an add supports rule to say, in this case, when the browser supports color v1, I can use this style, and otherwise I use a different style. The other thing in terms of CSS interaction is font palette. So um, color, like the source colors or the actual colors that you use in a test or in a, in a font like this, they are in a separate table called the CPAL table, so the palette table. Um, so if uh, color is used in a glyph, it's usually just an index that points into the CPAL table. And font palette in CSS allows you to change what's in the palette, and then you can recolorize your emoji font. That's great. You mentioned cro uh, browser compatibility. Uh, how it goes with the uh, color v1? Because nah. Yes, so at the moment, Chrome is the only browser releasing it. Um, there, there is a way of using Skia with WebAssembly to display um, color v1 in other browsers as well. Um, I would say at the moment, perhaps because OpenType SVG is supported in Safari, it's an option to use OpenType SVG as an alternative or fallback. Generally, the graphical capabilities are similar. And so, um, yeah, we're hoping for more support. Uh, I think we've received some positive signals. Microsoft is releasing this in, in Edge as well, or it is actually released in Edge as well, so it's not only Chrome that supports it. Um, and we, we've received some positive signals from Mozilla on, on this format, and um, we're hoping for support there in the future. Oh, I have here some things on the chat as well. Uh, that um, curiosity in what happens uh, where this works with the text to speech. It does work with text to speech because it's like um, it's text at the bottom of it. Like um, I'm not sure exactly what screen readers do with emoji. I think some give them names and like um, in Unicode, every emoji has like a name as well that the screen readers can can use. So otherwise, copy and pasting it into a different, like in a text editor that doesn't use fonts and just like uses text only, it would copy as text. And, and so screen readers can read it if it's, if it's written text. Okay, we have more questions on, um, it is possible to combine variable fonts with web animations API? Um, only indirectly, I, th I think. I'm not too familiar with web animations API, but um, you can apply, um, I think you can put the font variation settings CSS for applying the variations into styles that are used as, um, as the anim like CSS animations, and then it is animated. However, there, there are some performance 
uh, issues when you animate text, it also causes real layouts, so it's not the most efficient way to do animation, so it can get a bit heavy on the page. I hope that answers the question. Um, yes. Well, we have more questions. Did you find rasterization performance problems for complex fonts? Um, so, because the the um, Polbo Affera uh, emoji is, a, is, is taken from a photo and only quickly kind of vectorized, that one ended up being a very complex shape. Um, so, I think this one is not the most efficient to resize, but generally for something like the Noto emoji font, we don't see performance issues. Actually, um, we in our performance testing, we see that only if you show Noto emoji at the 128 pixel size that it is encoded in the font, in the, in the bitmap font, um, the bitmap decoding is a little bit faster, but if, if scaling is added, then the vector uh, glyphs draw faster than the bitmap glyphs. Okay, this means that we should work a little bit more on Galician emoji to make it <laughs> yeah, more Yeah, if, if we do Galician emoji, then they should be vector, not bitmaps. Cool. Any more questions here? And at home? Oh, we have one question there. I'm not sure if I... No. Yes. I'm going there. Uh, so you mentioned that you're using Skia and uh, FreeType. FreeType provides the base information structures from the font file. But uh, is it so that uh, Skia is not strictly needed that could be replaced by anything else that can do the uh, rasterization, rasterization operations needed? Yes. So the idea when we designed the format was what can we use as a common denominator? What do we have in most of the graphics libraries? We looked at Cairo. We looked at... Uh, core graphics, we looked at direct, uh, direct 2D and so on. And so yes, um, the paint operations that uh, I was listing, um, those can usually be implemented with any graphics library that also would be used for implementing CSS ideas, right? So like the conical gradients, or we call them sweep gradients, they are similar to CSS in terms of their semantics as well. Um, Linear gradients and, and the radial gradients, they're all similar to CSS concepts. So if, if your 2D graphics library can do that, or if your browser engine can do that, then you usually should find a way to implement these concepts as well. And secondly, the, the font goggles, font viewing tool that I was showing, this one um, experimentally has four different backends. So it has a Cairo backend already, and it has a Skia backend, and it has a core graphics backend. So there it's kind of experimentally shown that, that this works. Well, looks like uh, there is any remaining questions here at home. Cool. Uh, looks like we started with uh, Leo uh, talking about all the improvements uh, on the web standards. We also, uh, after with Dominic, about making also the web more beautiful and has a place for Galician's emoji. And I'm waiting for my emoji as well. And now it looks like we're going to have a break, a 40 minutes break. And then we come back with uh, the remaining talks. And uh, an applause for Dominic. And thank you. Thank you.